2022. This is the House Judiciary Committee, and we have a docket of Senate bills now that we will be hearing today. And we're going to be starting with a bill that was uh, offered uh, or introduced on behalf of the administration, Senate Bill 392. It was significantly changed in the Senate, um, but nevertheless here to testify in favor of, of the bill is Aaron Chase, who's here from the governor's office, I believe. Aaron Chase? Yep, I'm here, thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's fine. Oh, I see you. Okay, great. And so we'll um, we'll hear from you for three minutes, and then we'll take questions from the committee. So go ahead. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Clippinger, Vice Chair Moon, and members of the House Judiciary Committee. My name is Erin Chase, Deputy Legislative Officer with the Governor's Office. I'm here to, today to ask for a favorable report on Senate Bill 392, the Administration's Judicial Transparency Act of 2022. As you know, the Judicial Transparency Act seeks to bring much needed transparency to the state's judicial branch by expanding the data points available to the public as it relates to crimes of violence. Given the historic rise in violent crime in the state, we need to take an all hands on deck approach and look at all aspects of the criminal justice system to determine how to bring about effective change to reduce incidents of violent crime. As amended, the bill will require the Maryland State Commission on Criminal Sentencing Policy to provide in its annual report and on a public data, data dashboard, the following information for each crime of violence disaggregated by county. Number one, the number and percentage of sentencing events in each disposition category. Two, the number and percentage of sentencing events that resulted in a departure from the sentencing guidelines and three, for sentencing, sentencing events that resulted in a departure from the guidelines, the departure reason cited, and the number and percentage for each cited reason. Additionally, the, bill, the following information would also have to be reported for each crime of violence disaggregated by county and crime. One, the total average total sentence. Two, the average non-suspended sentence. And three, for sentences where a portion was suspended, the average percentage of the total, total sentence suspended. Understanding that the more rural counties have a small number of circuit court judges, the bill allows the counties within the first, second, and fourth judicial circuits to report the information by circuit rather than county. Senate Bill 392 is a step in the right direction and will help, public and po help the public and policymakers better understand the judicial system and will ultimately bring us closer to a more transparent criminal justice system. On behalf of the Hogan administration, we look forward to working with the committee on this legislation so that we can have a better understanding of how the judiciary is sentencing those who are committing violent crimes. For these reasons, I respectfully request a favorable report on Senate Bill 392. I'm happy to answer any questions the committee may have. All right. Are there any questions from the committee from for Aaron Chase from the governor's office? We'll start with the vice chair, then Delegate Juanica Fisher. Vice chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I have two questions. One, does the bill do anything to explain the circumstances behind the departures or the reasons for them, or is it just strictly looking at numbers? Um, and number two, uh, why just crimes of violence? Um, you know, if we think information is good, why would we want to restrict it to just one section of code? Thank you, Delegate Moon. I'll start with uh, your last question first. Um, so the original bill, as it came in, dealt strictly with crimes of violence. Of course, if the committee wants to expand that, I'm happy to have those conversations. Um, when it comes to the circumstances for departure, um, I believe the amended bill um, doesn't really talk about the specifics, but for all of the departure reasons that are available to the you know judiciary when they are entering their sentencing guidelines worksheets, those would each be pulled out. Um, and I believe they have a section for them to add other reasons that might not be listed already. Um, so they could perhaps add the, any additional information in, in that manner. Let me, let me pile on with a question, uh, sort of building on the vice chair's question. If, so this is connected to the submission of sentencing guidelines sheets, correct? Yes. And you don't fill in a sentencing guideline sheet for every single offense, correct? I believe it's for certain, I think, sentencing events. 
Right. But, but they, when I was prosecuting district court, you didn't have sentencing guidelines, didn't have to do sentencing guidelines in district court. Generally speaking, these are just for felonies, correct? Yeah, for circuit court cases. For and circuit there's a, court an case. exception for a couple district court cases. Okay. So the, the way that this is structured, at least in the way that the bill came over from the Senate, it, it is, it's, it's focused on just those cases where there was a sentencing guidelines form filled out. So you couldn't really do everything, but you could do, you could do basically the circuit court cases if you wanted to expand it beyond that. I believe so, yes. Okay. All right. I'll stop now and go to Delegate Fisher. Sorry, Mr. Chair, I was having trouble with my mouse. Um, thank you, Ms. Chase, for being here today. Um, I just had two questions. Does any other state do this kind of reporting? So each sentencing commission, I think, is a little bit different. Um, I know that Pennsylvania has some sort of approach, and I think at one point they were actually releasing the judges' names. I'm not sure if that's the case anymore, uh, but happy to look into additional information and get back to you on that. And then my other question, and I, I didn't have a chance to look through what the Senate amended on the bill, is the, is the reporting of this data indefinite? Like we're, we're saying we're going to report this for like 10 years and take a look and maybe come up with a certain plan as of something you want to address, or it's like forever and ever in Maryland, this data will be released. So it would, it's an ongoing, um, there's no sunset or anything on the data. It'd be reported similar to all the data points that are currently reported in the Sentencing Commission's annual report. Um, and these would also be available on a public data dashboard. Okay. I think my, my, I think like, I can't speak for other people, but I think the issues that I always have with all of these bills that have different transparency and reporting is that cases are just so unique and different things happen in different jurisdictions and what what a prosecutor in Prince George's County thinks they'll get in a jury is going to be very different than what a prosecutor thinks they might be able to get in Cecil. So, you know, things are just, there's just so many factors and it's the same kind of conversation we've had with transparency. I remember when um, Fraternal Order of Police was kind of um, concerned with different aspects of, of their own process being more public because you only get the flash headline and not the details. What do you think that what do you think in the bill provides safeguards for our community in understanding what's happening in all these cases and not just crime, name, time, and that's it? I think that's a great question, Delegate Fisher. Um, and happy to kind of explore that more. Um, but I think generally that I think this is going to give us a better idea of sentencing trends across the state. And I think it's important to kind of look at that from not only a county by county or in the more rural jurisdictions by circuit. Um, but I think kind of, you know, the judge's name was eliminated from this bill. I think there's safeguards for the judges in that case, since I know that was previously a concern. Um, but I think, you know, when we look at this data, we have to, you know, there's always going to be that caveat that each case is a little bit different. Um, and I think by kind of disaggregating this data um, will give us a more holistic view. Um, and I think, you know, if there's, you know, fine tuning we need to do to ensure those safeguards, I'm definitely happy to have those conversations. Delegate McComas, who is muted. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Ms. Chase, just a quick question. Um, this this uh, bill is not um, what, you're, what, what the metrics you're using and the things you're investigating. It's not uh, in stone, is it? In other words, if you find out that what you're looking at is not giving you the information you want, it could be changed next year or uh, a year or two later, correct? That's my understanding that, you know, legislature could always come back and change the data metrics that they're looking for. Um, the sentencing commission may be able to pull different data points at their leisure as well, um, but definitely not set in stone, just like all legislation. So, so in other words, this is really just the first bite at the apple and see how, see how it tastes. And then if it, if it needs fixing, you, you can do that, correct? Certainly. Um, and, you know, I think this is the, you know, the first step in the right direction towards bringing additional transparency towards the judiciary. Um, you know, there's a lot of transparency measures with the legislature. Um, as you know, all of your votes and votes on amendments are public. So I think this provides, you know, an, an additional opportunity to kind of have a better look at the data 
um, that the judiciary reports and you know, look at those sentencing trends across the state. And, and right now, the judiciary does not have a format which you're proposing that does a, a deeper dive and analysis of, of the statistics that you will get, correct? Not to my knowledge, not right now. Okay, thank you very much. Delegate Tolls. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't know if you all can see me. I can barely see myself, but um, on here. Um, so I just had a, a quick question. It looks like um, the bill that was sent over from the Senate um, removes some of the, I guess, um, wording or processes for the judicial for the courts. So the um, judiciary concerns, does that mean they have been addressed in this um, amended bill? So delegate, um, I don't want to speak for the judiciary, but we did work closely with them and the sentencing commission when um, developing amendments for this. Um, so I'm not sure what the exact position of the judiciary is. I'm happy to reach out to them. Um, and get back to you, but I don't want to speak for them. <laughs> yeah, so you had initial conversation. You can't speak to whether you had a follow-up conversation with them in terms of their concerns based off the amended bill that came over because because there are certain, you know, the, the public defender's office, the uh, judiciary, it's actually as well as um, my former <laughs> dean, of the law school I attended is um, in opposition of this as well. So I don't know if you were able to work through some of those concerns that, with the amended bill. So you haven't gone back to them yet is what you're saying? Not since we've discussed amendments. Um, you know, I think we removed the, the most, the, you know, the biggest sticking point, which was the judicial identifier. I think that's the biggest part. And I think we wanted to make sure that um, the data being reported was in line with the sentencing commission's um, enabling statute. Uh, so I think we're in a good place, but I'm happy to check in with both entities to see um, what the position of the bill may be. Okay, wonderful. And then could you just follow up with my office? I'm just curious. I just, um, and, I, and I will reach out to them as well, but I just wanted to, you know, ensure that their concerns were met. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Delegate Williams. Actually, Delegate Tolls asked a question I was going to ask, but yeah, I am curious as to where the judiciary is on this now with the um, proposed, with the changes out of the Senate. So thank you. Absolutely. All right. Are there further questions for Ms. Chase? Seeing none, we do thank you very much for coming and presenting the bill today. And that concludes the testimony on Senate Bill 392. Thank you very much. We're going to hear now on uh, Senate Bill 216. I think it's Dan Katz. Yes, Dan Katz. Uh, we'll hear from him uh, for three minutes on Senate Bill uh, 216. As Mr. Katz is connecting to audio, so we'll give him just a moment. Um. Dylan, is Senator Walt Stryker speaking on behalf of, of the committee? Does he have, no, he's got another bill. That's not him. So I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, did you call me? No, not yet. I'm sorry. I think unless you're going to testify on 216, I think you're just here for 26, right? Yep. Chair Clippinger, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Mr. Katz. That's fine. Okay. But but let's do that. We're just, we're going to hear from you on Senate Bill 216. Okay. And uh, you've got three minutes. Go right ahead. Sure thing. Uh, Chair Klimpinger, Vice Chair Moon, and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Dan Katz. I'm the director of the Maryland State Police Forensic Sciences Division. I'm here today to express my support for uh, Senate Bill 216, which transfers the responsibilities for the anti-mortem blood and breath testing programs and support of impaired driving investigations from the toxicologist under the Postmortem Examiner's Commission to a newly created toxicologist under the Maryland State Police Forensic Sciences Division. This is a mutually beneficial arrangement for both the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner and the Maryland State Police. Uh, the Office of Chief Medical Examiner postmortem toxicology operations continue to be overwhelmed due to the ever rising number of autopsies requiring toxicology results and removing this responsibility will offer them some relief. 
Meanwhile, the Department of State Police toxicology operations are in the midst of an expansion of our technology, staffing, and facilities to better meet the needs of our customers. In order to, in order to ensure long-term success, it is imperative that we have our own toxicologists to guide us forward and that our toxicologist specializes in anti-mortem forensic toxicology rather than post-mortem forensic toxicology. For the reasons mentioned, the Department of State Police requests a favorable report for Senate Bill 216. Thank you. All right, are there any questions for Mr. Katz? Delegate Howell. <clears throat> yes, my question is, will transferring it to the state, is that gonna make the results? Are we gonna get the results sooner? That, that is the hope uh, and, and that's what we're building towards. So um, nothing is changing in regards to who is doing the testing. The Maryland State Police has always been doing the, the, the toxicology testing in support of um, impaired driving, which this is. But the way that the system has been set up since 1962 is that the toxicologist who is actually employed by the Department of Health, the Office of Chief Medical Examiner, um, oversaw the Maryland State Police's laboratory. So uh, they, were, they weren't in the direct chain uh, of command of that laboratory. So it has proven um, cumbersome and, and, uh, and problematic for both the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, as well as for um, Maryland State Police, which is in the process of doing a large expansion of our toxicology operations, um, in large part due to um, feedback that we received from the legislature. Okay, thank you. Delegate McComas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just briefly, um, I wanted to know if the fact that you are separating yourselves from the um, from the the, uh, tox the chief medical examiner's office, if this will help when it comes a time that we can deal with impaired drivers under the influence of drugs um, or tr combined drugs and alcohol, um, since we're going to be probably going to be legalizing marijuana. I mean, we're on that path, and then we've already allowed for medical marijuana. So I think this will allow you, will this allow you to really be able to get the latest technology once, once it's developed? That, that, that is absolutely correct. So one of the things that has um, been problematic is again, having uh, that, uh, that oversight and that leadership um, and expertise, um, having it in our own command and working daily with our own laboratory um, staff will allow us to bring on the newer technology that we are already seeking out, um, but it will allow us to do it much more efficiently and effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Are there other questions? Seeing none, we thank you very much. And that concludes the testimony for Senate Bill, Senate Bill 216. So thank you very much for that. We're now going to go to the Vice Chair of Judicial Proceedings, uh, to Senator Waldstreicher for Senate Bill 26. Uh, we're going to hear from him, just him, and that's fine. We'll hear from him for three minutes. So Senator Waldstreicher, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, this bill has no cross file, so this is the first time this committee is hearing this legislation. Uh, this bill is a non-substantive technical fix to legislation that your committee uh, voted overwhelmingly to pass last year. Last year, your committee voted to pass SB 201. And thank you to the cross file uh, Delegate Winika Fisher and to the Vice Chairman, Delegate David Moon for moving that bill through the process. Um, you guys can see these books behind me. As you know, um, the, these books are published by a third party publisher. They are not published by the state. Third party publishers add titles to the laws we pass. The titles themselves are not law, but they do appear on the internet and in the books and are used by both lawyers and judges in interpreting the law. The bill that we passed last year was mistitled by a third party publisher. Senate committee counsel 
indicated to the publisher that it had been mistitled. The publisher indicated that for them to retitle the bill as we intended, uh, we would need to clarify the language in the bill, which was being misinterpreted by them. And so committee counsel brought this to my attention. I submitted this legislation. Again, it is non-substantive, it is technical, and it is intended to indicate to the third party publisher exactly what we did when last year your body and your committee passed SB 201. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, they'll go to questions now, Delegate Cardin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Senator Watstraker for bringing the bill. Of course, I'm gonna support this legislation. I'm just curious, in your research, did, did you find that these third party publishers are creating titles that are of, of their own editing. They, they, can, they can use their own um, kind of creations based on the text of the language to create their own titles? Correct. Third-party publishers for every law that we pass create headers and titles in, their, in the books that they publish, which of course are usually accessed online. These titles are viewed by lawyers and judges and it affects their interpretation of the legislation. And do they do they check with anybody from, whether it be the judiciary or the legislature or the Department of Legislative Services um, before they create these, these titles? So committee counsel can best answer that question at some later point, but my understanding is that the answer is no. They do not, as a matter of routine, check with DLS or anyone when they title bills in the books and online. And as, as far as you know, this is the first time, you know, we've, we've been around quite a number of years. This is the first time that I've heard of this. Is, is this just not a problem where we have third party people coming in and making titles and we've never had them mistitled until today? It is at least the first time it was brought to the attention of Senate Committee Council, uh, to my oh. knowledge. Okay, I, I'm, I'm, maybe we ought to look into this a little bit deeper and make sure we're not having this problem all over the place. But thank you, that, this, thanks for the bill. Thank you, Delegate. Any further questions for Senator Waldstreicher? Seeing none, we thank you very much for testifying here today. And that concludes Senate Bill 26. Thank you all. Thank you. Going now, I think we're going to end up going, I don't see Senator McCray's office. So wait, yes, I do. Senator McCray is not at his seat, apparently. Maybe if I say Senator McCray a couple more times, he'll hear Senator McCray and he'll come and sit down, testify for us. On the other hand, he may not, in which case, oh, wait, there he is. All right. If you say his name three times, he appears. Senator McRae is here on Senate Bill 13, please. So Senate Bill 13, it is Senator McRae. I think this is the first time we've, maybe, we heard this. So yes, but it's Senator McRae and that's it. So we'll hear from him right now. Senator McRae. Yep. First, I just want to say thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Your new role. And there are a slew of new delegates um, that I come to, this committee has changed dramatically. So um, it's great to see Delegate Faye Martin Howe. It's great to see Delegate Munez. And it's great to see, it was one more, oh my God, everybody know Karen Tolles. It's great to see Delegate Tolles um, uh, in judiciary. Mr. Chi, I come to you in reference to Senate Bill 13. Um, Senate Bill 13, I get the proud privilege to chair what we call Public Safety Transportation Administration over in the Budget Committee in the Senate. And one of the things is, is that I get to look at a number of the reports that come before us. There was an OPEGA report in July 2021, where we took a look at the Vehicle Theft Prevention Council. The Vehicle Theft Prevention Council is a phenomenal organization that awards grants to many of our jurisdictions. It's about a $2 million pot. Um, but on page 19 of that report um, that was given for uh, OPEGA in reference to Vehicle Theft Prevention Council, there was a recommendation to make sure that instead of us awarding money from a population standpoint, that we award money where the thefts are concentrated at. So we award them off of the number of thefts versus just generically off of the population of the respective jurisdiction. I, I got with the state police, I got with the executive director of the Vehicle Theft Prevention Council, 
Um, I got with a number of the folks that were impacted by it, Nopega with Mike Powell, and came up with a, a middle ground legislation that pretty much does exactly what was recommended in Appendix B from that Opega report that was there. So I do I believe that this is a consensus bill that has moved through the Senate. I believe that it was 47-0 when it moved through the Senate and hoping, hoping that this can move in the same posture uh, when we go before uh, judiciary and it hits the House floor, if, if that's possible. Okay, right, we'll take questions now. Delegate Williams, please. Hi, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, hi, Senator McRae. Really quick question. Um, I saw that the Maryland State Police uh, came in favorable with amendments, and I do see that there's an amendment um, here in the file. Um, so does that amendment, I guess, kind of address the concerns that were raised by the Maryland State Police? Now, they had came in as introduced uh, when it first was introduced in the Senate. I'm not sure if that's the same testimony. I don't have the, um, the testimony, so I don't know what the date says on the testimony. That uh, Let me pull it up here. I just was reading it. It's dated February 1st. I think that that was, that was pretty much when we uh, had it introduced and it, it got worked out. Like I said, I pulled all of them together, the executive director of vehicle theft, state police, Mike Powell from Opega, and we got okay. And figured out where everybody could be happy. Okay. All right. That, that's my only question. Thanks. Delegate yeah. Tolls. Hello, Senator McCray. How are How you? How you doing? doing? How you doing? How you doing? How you doing, my friend? Good to see you as always. Um, quick question. I know that you are aware of some of the vehicle um, increasing uh, vehicle uh, thefts. Um, in you know my jurisdiction mm -hmm. and probably yours as well as others um, outside of Baltimore or Prince George's that are close to the District of Columbia border. Can you tell me how this bill um, will assist with the with the slight change in this? Can you tell me how it will further assist those jurisdictions? I think that uh, I have been seeing a reference to increase uh, vehicle theft of, of jurisdictions such as Prince George's. And what happens is I just think you should spend tax dollars prudently. So we were awarding off of a population. Opega comes out and makes a re recommendation. Hey, we should be awarding how thefts happen, where they're happening at, where are they concentrating and mo moving the dollars in that direction. Um, state police, the, uh, the, the executive director for vehicle theft also agreed in reference to that posture, but I do think that jurisdictions where there have been increased vehicle theft would, such as Prince George's, would be very well uh, taken care of in this bill. It says to the extent practical, so it's kind of like pushing in that direction that where we make sure that our tax dollars are moving more efficiently and effectively. Okay, no, I appreciate that. We have definitely in Prince George's seen a increase in um, vehicle theft and you know, working with the state's attorney and the county executive to, um, you know, remedy those uh, uh, issues. And so I appreciate your work on this bill. Um, looks like it will help go toward that effort. So thank you for your work. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Delegate. Delegate McComas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just have a couple of quick questions for Senator McCray. Number one, uh, Okay, Prince George's has a high um, uh, theft. Uh, are there any other counties that surround Washington, D.C. that have, have high uh, theft problems as well? In the fiscal note, you'll see that they list out a number of our uh, counties, and it uh, lets you know what is the dollar amount that folks get off of that $2 million pot. So you'll, you'll see that uh, the, there's a line that says percentage of state car registration, but the second one, Delegate McComas, says percentage of vehicle theft. So if you look down at Prince George's, they come in second place. They have 24.11% of the vehicle thefts that happen in our state. So they're almost at a quarter of the vehicle thefts that happen at our state. And just for some historical context for the rest of the committee, like this is policy that was passed back when Dana Dembro and people were here. So like we have to take a look at things just to make sure that they're operating in a manner 20 years later that we still want to go in that direction. And that's why Opega did that report. And that's why Opega made that recommendation. Um, just a, a real quick question. Um, do, do you feel that it would benefit if, if the, the, the high 
Steph, well, who's who's number one, actually? Is it Baltimore City? Or? Unfortunately, Baltimore City does get 35% of the vehicle thefts, yes. Oh, wow. Um, I was just wondering if it would help, but I guess maybe not, if, if there would be some kind of coordination with D.C. as well, not, you know, as far as with this problem, but maybe does D.C. have a higher rate or not of theft? The District right? of Columbia? Yeah. I'm, I'm not well-versed in reference to the district okay. of Columbia. I, I, I guess because well that, one, that one gentleman, you know, lost his life and it, I think, or was, you know, very, very hurt by the two, two girls, you know. I do think was, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, so, okay. Thank you very much, Senator. Thank you. Are there are further questions for Senator McCray. All right, seeing none, we thank you all very much. And that concludes the testimony for Senate. Thank you, Gilbert. Mr. Chair. Y'all have a blessed day. Thank you. We'll go to Senate Bill 68 now with Senator Bailey. Um, this is a bill of first impression for the committee. So um, we have Senator Bailey. We also now have Debbie Feinstein, Annie Kenny, Catherine Marsh. Um, who are going to testify. There are several people who have put in written testimony, including Jamie Sterling, Jessica Garth, Lisa Jordan. So we'll hear from Senator Bailey, Debbie Feinstein, Kenny, uh, Annie Kenny, and Catherine Marsh. The Senator will get three minutes. Why are you telling me? Am I wrong? Oh, we're only hearing Senator Bailey? All right. This isn't my first rodeo, but Dylan has come in here and upbraided me and told me I'm only hearing from Senator Brady. Bailey, we don't even have a Senator Brady. This is what happens after crossover. Maybe we should just pull over the, the committee and I'll start again. But instead, why don't we hear from Senator Bailey for three minutes? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon to you and to the other distinguished members of the committee. For the record, Senator Jack Bailey, District 29, representing St. Mary's and Calvert County. Today, I'm talking to you about Senate Bill 68, which deals with sexual offenses, crimes of violence, and lifetime supervision. This bill resolves an inconsistency in current Maryland law and ensures that offenders who commit sexual abuse of a minor are subject to existing penalties and supervision to decrease the risk of recidivism. Under current law, an offender who commits sexual abuse of a minor in violation of 3602 of the criminal law article against the minor under the age of 13 is considered to have committed a crime of violence under certain circumstances. While an offender who violates 3602 against the minor under the age of 12 is subject to lifetime supervision. This inconsistency means that a person who committed, commits this crime against a victim who is 12 year old, who's 12 years old, has committed a crime of violence, but is not subject to lifetime supervision. This bill makes these provisions consistent by requiring lifetime supervision for offenders who violate 3602 against the minor under the age of 13. It is important to note that a person may petition for discharge from lifetime sexual offender supervision after serving five years of extended sexual offender supervision. Also, if a petitioner is discharged, if that petition is for discharge is denied, that person can review that petition every year. The other provision of this bill addresses incidents of 3602 where the victim is 13, 14, or 15 years old. These victims deserve the same protections as those who are under the age of 13. This bill specifically specifies in cases where the victim is between age 13 and 15 and crimes of violence statute and lifetime supervision will only apply to offenders who are 29 or older. Senate Bill 68 makes no other changes to the circumstances already in law for when violations of 3602 is considered to be a crime of violence. This bill is narrowly targeted to protect Marylanders from a relatively small but significant number of offenders who have committed these very serious crimes. This bill is prospective and does not apply to any conviction before the bill's effective date, 
Senate Bill 68 is designed to protect our most vulnerable citizens from some of the most heinous crimes, especially felony sexual assaults. This bill passed the Senate 45 to nothing. I respectfully request a favorable report on Senate Bill 68. I thank you all for your consideration. And I would ask you, um, as <clears throat> the chairman spoke, there is a lot of written testimony in support of this bill from uh, many very esteemed colleagues in the judicial world. All right, and I apologize for my confusion earlier. I'll just, I should have restated the rule, I guess, for the committee. If there are people who are coming in unfavorable, we're going to let the uh, favorable witnesses include other people to testify on their behalf, and we'll hear from people testifying unfavorable. In this case, there's no one in the bill uh, uh, signed up on the bill testifying unfavorable, so I was wrong to go into those other witnesses, and I deeply apologize and deserve the scorn that I, yeah. All right, so let's go with questions. Delegate Eric Hand, then Bartlett, then McComas. Delegate Eric Hand, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, Senator Bailey, for being here and for bringing this bill to us. Um, as you probably know, we've heard this bill many years, and hopefully this will be the year that we we move it. Um, I wanted to give you an opportunity, uh, even though OPD did not um, testify today and doesn't intend to, they did send in written opposition. Um, I've looked through it, it's, it's quite lengthy and I'm happy to send it to you if you haven't seen it already. Um, but mostly they're complaining about um, uh, registries in general. Can you just speak to and, and make clear um, the impact this will have on, on the registry process uh, for those who will now come under lifetime supervision um, and anything else you'd like to add uh, about the uh, public defender's opposition. So thank you very much, uh, Delegate Eric. I'm, <clears throat> I'm just going to say there's been a lot of talk about uh, lifetime supervision and is lifetime supervision lifetime. Lifetime supervision, as I tried to uh, uh, state, it's uh, five years um, and after five years, um, they can then petition uh, the court to get off of lifetime uh, supervision. And that uh, sexual offenders management team that they would be petitioning is a member, a uh, specialized mental health uh, professional, a specialized probation agent, and a registering agent. And the main thing uh, that that uh, sexual offender management team uh, will be doing is conducting uh, a professional hearing to determine whether that person is uh, still a risk uh, to violate again. And that's the main thing. And then so um, the issue is that's what that uh, uh, five years is. And um, so that, that I think was a lot of the opposition. I think a lot of people really didn't understand uh, that when, uh, when it was originally uh, discussed. And, uh, but I think uh, that, is, uh, that, is, that is where we are. If we talk about how many people are on lifetime supervision uh, for this, uh, these offenses, last time there was, last year there was 25. Um, this year there's 24. Um, so uh, we're dealing with a relatively small uh, uh, number of people, but uh, these people have uh, committed the most uh, heinous crimes against, uh, against our young, um, young constituents. Let's go to Delegate Bartlett, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Senator Bailey, I will uh, say I was one of those people. I was very happy to hear you just now uh, mention the um, five year, because when I was going over the bill, all I could think about was the 17 year old sex offender because of the four year difference. And I kept thinking, what are we gonna do with this, sex, this 17 year old who's gonna be on lifetime supervision forever? Um, so thank you. And um, I guess Delegate Eric can um, ask the question in anticipation because she, she, she asked my question. Um, but I will say also, this is why the code is important to have in your office, because I think you're talking about section 11-724 um, and the section that you're amending is 11-723. So this is, this is why the code is good to have handy so you can see it all at one time. Isn't that so? I think that is correct. Thank you. Okay, first, isn't that so after crossover? Uh, Delegate McComas, please. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just real quick, um, I would think that this bill would also help um, the issue of human trafficking of, of uh, young girls, um, because you know some, some of the kids, 13, well, young, probably 12 through 15 um, are likely to be trafficked. And this could maybe you know, be just a little bit more of a damper on that. Would you say, Senator? Um, thank you uh, very much for that question. And I, and I think uh, that, that uh, you know, I, <clears throat> just for the record, I was a police officer for uh, 30 years and there are uh, terrible acts that people commit. Um, and I think that it is very important that all of these laws we can use together to try to stop uh, any type of child trafficking. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Delegate Wanika Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Senator Bailey. I know you and I have talked, we talked a little bit about the bill last year uh, together. And I guess my question is, right now, is there anything in law that prevents a judge to put a defendant on lifetime supervision for any of the crimes listed in the bill? So, <clears throat> Delegate, you are uh, definitely putting me in an unfortunate situation that I do not know every part of the law when it comes to that. I do know that if the um, victim is under uh, age 11, 11 or under, yes, they would go for lifetime. Um, that, is, uh, that, is, that is currently uh, the law uh, concerning this. And then there's, there's two parts to the bill. One includes 12 no matter what the uh, offender's age is, and then 13, 14, and 15, if the offender is over 21 years of age. Thank you for that. I guess I will, I'll ask counsel to clarify what discretion, because my understanding was if you were, if the victim was over the age of 11 or 12, the judge would have discretion. Like it, it doesn't mean you can't get lifetime, a judge could. And this bill is requiring that with the different age, you know, separation. So I will, I will ask um, clarity about that. And then my other question is, we talked, you talked about the five years and that people petition to get off of it and you can keep petitioning. Do you have any data of like anyone that has been on lifetime and successfully been petitioned off? I currently, um, uh, wrote these questions uh, to the judiciary to try to get that answer. Uh, and I got um, a back a response just as the hearing was started. So I haven't had a chance to read it. Um, no problem. You can just send it to me because that's, I think that's, I really appreciate and understand and care about the, the intention of the bill. I think my thing is, and I always find it hard once you punish someone or put someone off, I just feel like the likelihood of a judge being like, yes, I think you're healed and I'm gonna take you off the registry is just so slim to me. And yes, it's only 25, I think you said 25 and 24 people, but I think as like as a policy decision and that's what we're doing, I just, I would wanna do something that if it has been 10 years or 15 years and the person is really um, rehabilitated and ready to get off, but there's actually a chance they will and at least for this committee, that's another reason why we ended up in the situation with getting the governor out of parole. And that was controversial because no matter how many times you'd ask, you never you never got out. So th so that's like that's my my biggest issue. So if you could send um, some information on that, that would be great. Um, we will uh, follow up uh, with you on that. But the one thing I can tell you is, uh, Delegate, the, the recommendation of whether or not to get off is done uh, by this sexual offender management team that's actually defined in statute. And one, one of those people is a mental health uh, professional. One is a specialized probation agent just dealing with this. And the third is the registering agent. And they are the ones that make the actual recommendation uh, to, uh, to the court about whether or not that the person gets off or not. So that is, uh, it's not just this person walking in um, to the court and asking and then having a judge uh, uh, accept or deny it. This is um, a very uh, professional uh, uh, meeting that happens and then they uh, evaluate that. And then that's the recommendation that goes to the court. 
Um, and, I, and I think uh, just appropriately based on the fact that when we're talking about people that have, uh, for the most part, committed uh, felony sexual assaults against children. Um, but obviously, uh, once they're no longer, once we think recidiv recidivism is not going to happen again, we should get those people back into society. I agree with you. Delegate Rachel Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Bailey. It's good to see you. Uh, I just, my questions have sort of been answered in your response just now uh, to Delegate Fisher. I was going to ask you to clarify the age uh, caps and how that had changed from the, uh, the previous version of the bill last year and to talk about um, the lifetime supervision process, but that has been done, isn't it so? Yes, it is. Thank you. Are there further questions for Senator Bailey? Seeing none, we thank you, Senator, very much for being here today. And that concludes the testimony for Senate Bill 68. Now. Thank you all. Thank you. We now have a bill where there are people for and against. So now we are going to hear from more than just merely Senator Sidney. Um, we're going to hear from Senator Sidnor, Melanie Shapiro, Lisa Jordan, in favor of Senate Bill 31. And then we're going to hear from Deborah Gardner and David Roca uh, in opposition to Senate Bill 31. We'll take questions in between. So Senator Sidnor, if you'd like for three minutes, and then we'll hear from Melanie Shapiro and Lisa Jordan for two. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and uh, good afternoon, uh, Judiciary. Uh, Senator Charles Sidnall, for the record, testifying in support of Senate Bill 31. Uh, Senate Bill 31 is actually a bill uh, that your committee uh, passed uh, back in 2016, died in the Senate. Uh, later on, uh, once I was in the Senate, uh, it's been able to pass the Senate, but I was unable to pass in the House. What this bill does, it, we, we passed it back in, like I said, in 2016, after the implementation of body cam body worn cameras. And, and what the bill does is that it, it creates certain categories of uh, video uh, that would not be or would provide the custodian uh, uh, the the ability not not to not not to release uh, certain types of videos. Uh, so if you were to look at uh, section uh, 4-357B1I uh, through 5 talks about the different portions of uh, those types of body-worn camera uh, that the custodian would have that we would prohibit from being released. A good bit of this video deals with uh, 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 video that may uh, concern people or victims of domestic violence, uh, situations where uh, one might be able to be identified as a victim of uh, a certain set of crimes, uh, the death of the law, a law enforcement officer, as well as one other category, which uh, was drafted so that uh, for those who may have certain interactions with law enforcement that uh, that does not end in a uh, detention or an arrest and uh, uh, a search, uh, those types of interactions also would be uh, 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 prohibited from being released. Why, why would you do this? Uh, one, uh, in terms of uh, people who have been uh, or victims of domestic violence, it's, it's about privacy. So when body cameras were uh, first enacted, it was it was all it was the art. Or the, the discussion was around how one can ensure public safety, but also uh, ensure that people's uh, right to privacy uh, was uh, respected. This bill attempts to do uh, some of that. Uh, what the bill also does it says that if you are the subject of uh, that video recording, you will have access to it. Uh, the custodian will not have the ability to uh, deny you that right. So you really control uh, the, the footage that's been captured on video. So say for instance, your uh, something that happened to you does not, falls 
within one of these uh, categories. You could go in, you could request uh, that copy of that footage and you could share it with uh, a third party. It's, it's, it, it, it would be yours and, you, and yours to control. So uh, uh, that, that's, that's in essence what this bill does. Uh, and with that, I, I'll, I'll certainly rest. Thank you very much. We'll go to Melanie Shapiro now for two minutes and then Lisa Jordan for two. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee, Melanie Shapiro, Public Policy Director with the Maryland Network Against Domestic Violence. I'd like to thank Senator Signor um, for bringing this important bill. I think it's important to be very clear that the Maryland Network Against Domestic Violence supports police transparency. We support the use of body-worn cameras by law enforcement. Domestic violence is one of the most under, if not the most underreported crime um, with approximately half of all domestic violence incidents going unreported. And this bill would codify the recommendations of policy of the National Network to End Domestic Violence, the Battered Women's Justice Project, the International Association of Police Chiefs and Sheriffs, the um, 2015 Commission regarding the implementation and use of body cameras by law enforcement officers in Maryland, as well as the national policy of the ACLU promulgated regarding the use of body-worn cameras um, by law enforcement. I'm gonna read you a quote from what the ACLU said. It says, it is vital that public confidence in the integrity of body camera privacy protections be maintained. We don't want vic crime victims to be afraid to call for help because of fears that video of their officer interactions will become public or reach the wrong party. Confidence can only be created if good policies are put in place and backed up by good technology. And that's exactly what this bill is. It is good policy. It balances the very real privacy concerns and safety concerns of victims of domestic violence or sexual assault who have called for law enforcement intervention. They are wearing a body-worn camera and it prevents those images, those very private personal images from being released. It can help restore their confidence in law enforcement and encourage them to reach out if they in fact do need assistance. I would also point out that the Fourth Amendment, this is also talked about by the ACLU, there's a very real, you know, it bestows upon citizens certain reasonable expectations of privacy in places such as their homes. And when officers are responding, they're often filming in people's homes. Um, and it's audio and it's visual and it um, is very personal images. And we also, while the PIA currently allows for discretion um, for the release of body-worn camera footage, the question then becomes, who is viewing these endless hours of images? Who's making the decisions to release or not release? Are these the same people who know the victim? Are they friends? Are they colleagues? Are they even family? And um, there's also a very real safety concern because when law enforcement responds, they can be performing a lethality assessment. Ms. Shapiro, um, if you'd begin to wrap you. up, please. Thank you, yes, I will, Chairman. Um, and they could be connecting them to services. And if that body-worn camera image is released, it could contain that very safety information of where a victim um, might have, have sought um, a safe place to go. So for all of those reasons, we urge a favorable report on Senate Bill 31. You, Lisa Jordan, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. I'm Lisa Jordan with Maryland Coalition Against Sexual Assault. We also thank Senator Sidner for his continued advocacy on behalf of survivors and also echo our strong support for body worn cameras and for police accountability. I'll echo what's already been said and adopt that, but I also would like to start with what this bill does not do. This bill does not change access in civil discovery, including pre-litigation civil discovery. It does not change the rules permitting access to footage introduced in evidence in court. It does not limit the ability of a victim to see footage for any reason, including for holding law enforcement accountable. And it also does not prohibit alleged assailants from viewing the footage. What it does is it prohibits alleged assailants from copying the footage. And it also requires that the victim be notified if an alleged assailant sees that footage, which is important so you can plan for safety. It's a very carefully balanced bill that protects both the need for transparency and accountability and also the need for privacy. 
it's very important to understand that this is not a solution seeking a problem. This is very real. And I hope it's been filed on the House side. It definitely was filed on the Senate side. There is a case that the Women's Law Center is handling. And a, a battered woman has really been tormented by her abuser. She called the police. There was camera footage. He has repeatedly posted it, shared it on social media. She is now being abused continually and refusing to call the police. So her access to safety and to justice has really been, been interfered with by our current Public Information Act. There are many ways that people can still have access to viewing the footage, that people who need access can get the footage. If you are arrested, if there's an attempt arrest, if there is detention, if there is force against an individual, if the camera footage resulted in a complaint or allegation of officer misconduct, all of these things are not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is just Public Information Act access. These are your neighbors. These are the batterers. These are people who really don't need to have this footage and that this footage should not be then posted on the internet. For those reasons, we urge a favorable report on Senate Bill 31. Thank you very much. Are there questions for this panel? The vice chair, please. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Um, <laughs> what are you sorry about? By, this, by this, this, this bill, you know, this bill, is, I, 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 this bill kicks around um, every once and again, and I just have to clarify a couple of things. So, on um, Senator Sidnor, um, uh, good afternoon. Um, I, I guess that, so. The domestic violence scenarios um, seem sympathetic uh, in the bill, but it, it's. It weaves in several scenarios in it, and I'm a little concerned about some of the other ones. And so could you just elaborate on two things? One, the death of the officer scenario in here, um, I, you know, I, I could swing different ways on this, but I guess I'm curious if that's consistent with respect to how we treat the, any body cam footage um, with someone's death. Like, does the spouse of someone who's dead or family have the right to object to body cam footage release under a current law or under what's here, or is it just that scenario of a officer um, that has that right? And then second, um, you have the sweeper provision in this bill that appears to just be, and anything else. And I guess I'm just trying to understand what that's getting at and why that section is needed. My concern here is these are mandatory denials. They're not discretionary. And we already know the custodians are not in the business of handing things out um, when they feel they have the discretion to not do that. And in fact, it's my expectation that they do not want to um, do it. So if you could just clarify the sweeper provision, what, why, why we need that and um, how, whether, how we handle the death part is consistent with um, giving the same rights to everyone. Sure, and, and thank you for your question. On, uh, you're talking about on page five, lines 22 through 31, I believe. Uh, so to, to take the, uh, the depiction of the death of a law enforcement officer that occurred in the performance of the officer's duties, uh, that provision was included at the uh, request of the FOP some time ago and included uh, because of uh, one I, I, I could relate. Uh, my uncle, uh, he had a partner who was murdered during an undercover drug operation uh, back in the early 1980s. And I can remember uh, the news constantly playing over and over again the audio of this man being murdered during the course of his duty. And I can remember the impact that it had on uh, those who loved him. Um, and, uh, and so when they asked me to include it, I felt uh, I, I could understand why they wanted it included, and I did so. Now, why would we treat that differently uh, than anyone else? 
Uh, well, and it kind of gets to uh, the section uh, of for part five. Um, in part five, we list all of those things that I think any of us would kind of would have the uh, desire to know in terms of what was happening on on our streets. I believe if we had someone who was uh, uh, killed or if a homicide happened to a civilian uh, at at the hands of an officer, I'm, I can be most certain that the public would want a release of that video camera footage. Um, if it's one where an officer was killed in the line of duty, unless that officer was killed by another officer, I just don't think you have that same type of uh, public demand uh, for that footage. Uh, and so that goes into all the other kind of the, the list under section five. We're interested in, in what the, the arrests that officers make, the attempted arrests. We're interested in detentions and those temporary detentions. I think we'd be interested in whether or not searches were done uh, properly uh, when those uh, officers are given out citations uh, or even in the, the, the death or the injury of an individual. These are things that the public has an interest in. Uh, things that happen that don't amount to an arrest, uh, things that don't amount to a detention are things really that one would have to ask, I mean, what would be the, the, the public interest in that type of footage? Uh, so that, that's why we had to catch all. And I'll tell you for those uh, opponents who are gonna come in and testify, I held up my own bill for, for a number of weeks in attempts to trying to work with them to make certain that they were satisfied, put forth all types of, uh, a couple uh, different amendments and they weren't going for any, what they wanted, they did not want an outright uh, denial. They wanted it to be a May and we've had this discussion before. And unless it was gonna be a May, it was then we don't want the bill. And I told them that this just wasn't acceptable. I, th thank you. Uh, you know, we don't have to belabor the point. I, the details of past past year's debates on this are coming back to me now. I, I'll just leave you with one, and I hate to, to law school this thing, but I'll leave you with one example of a scenario that falls into your category. It would be excluded here. This would be in the in the in the scenario where what's going on is inaction by law enforcement. Um, you know that that I think it could squeak through. Uh, what's going on here. I know that's been a complaint in, in different recent um, high profile um, issues. Anyway, thank you. That's that's very helpful. And, and look, the, 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 the bill is now in this committees and and and, and I, I tried, like I said, I tried to work with the opponents. If y'all can figure out a way of working with the opponents, I'm not, I'm not against that. Uh, so. Any further questions for this panel? Seeing none, we thank you very much, Senator Sidnor. And we're going to move now to those people testifying in opposition. We're going to hear from Deborah Gardner and David Roca for two minutes, please. Two minutes each. Mr. Roca is coming in. It's now only Mr. Roca, it sounds like. Sounds like it's just going to be Mr. Roca. So, David Roca, are you there? There you are. All right. Mr. Roca, please, for two minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my name is David Roca. I'm a senior staff attorney at the ACLU of Maryland, here to urge an unfavorable report on SB 31, absent significant revision. Um, despite all of the supportive testimony on this bill, characterizing it as a victim's right bill, the primary effect of this bill has nothing whatsoever to do with victims' rights, and the provisions dealing with body-worn camera footage of victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, and abuse of minors and vulnerable adults are not what we oppose in the bill, nor have we ever opposed those provisions. And if you want to pass a bill limited to those provisions, which are subsections 
uh, little i through three little i on lines 14 to 25 on page five, then that would be a victim's rights bill, which we would not be opposing. Instead, this bill's primary effect is prohibit is to prohibit public access to body-worn camera footage of police activity unless it meets certain criteria, something that the chiefs and sheriffs have been trying to do since 2015. Body-worn camera footage is the single most effective way of holding police accountable, revealing time and time again that police version of events is simply not true, and the General Assembly should not be restricting access to such footage, footage particularly when the asserted justifications lack any basis in reality. The largest effect of this bill is contained on page five, line 28 through page six, line four. That provision combined with the introductory language uh, on lines 14 through 16 of page five requires, not permits as Senator Sidnor said, but requires police to deny inspection of all body-worn camera footage except to the subject of the footage unless the footage depicts the specific things listed on page five, line 28 through page six, line four. Contrary to what proponents say, that list of permitted disclosures does not encompass every type of police activity in which the public has an important and legitimate interest. Denying access to such footage has nothing to do with protecting victims or privacy, both of which in the abstract are certainly important and legitimate goals to which the ACLU is extremely committed. Existing law already explicitly allows custodians to consider the privacy implications of the release of public records. And because the denials of access in the bill are mandatory, not permissive, they give police unfettered and unreviewable discretion to characterize their conduct as falling outside of the permitted uh, denials without any means to challenge that characterization even though the terms used are not okay. self-defining and are contested literally daily in criminal cases. Mr. Rowe, um, we're going to need you to begin to wrap up, please. Let me just be specific about what uh, uh, wouldn't be released. Um, first, look at the difference between when body-worn cameras are required to be activated under Maryland law uh, at the initiation of a call for service or other activity that is investigative or enforcement in nature, um, and compare that to the very limited set of uh, uh, release that would be um, permitted in this bill. Um, more specifically, what it doesn't include are any searches of property. So for example, the videos of the BPD uh, planting drugs that they supposedly found in a search of a vacant lot, uh, or in their words, restaging what they claim they found while the cameras were off, those would have been prohibited from release. Mr. Police Rocha, conduct. Yeah. Going to need you to begin to wrap up, please. Um, well, let me just say there's multiple ways to fix the bill. Um, delete page five, lines 26 uh, through page six, line four, and leave the bill as applying only to footage of victims, or change the shall in page five, line 15 to May. Uh, either of those changes would fix the, the significant and huge problems. Um, with the um, mandatory denials that this bill uh, uh, requires. Thank you. We'll take questions now. Delegate Cardin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, the uh, Mr. Roca, just if I'm looking at lines um, 29, page 5, 29 through 20, page 6, um, line 4, I guess. And what you were just describing, can we just expand that list to cover um, searches of property and make you guys happy? Or is there, can you expand the list no. to other things? I mean, there's got to be some discretion for, you know, let's just say you have, you know, hundreds of hours it's and time and money of a footage that is, that's just, you know, walking around and doing nothing. like. I mean, clearly you can eliminate that and save everybody time and money, can't you? Right, but here, here's the problem. So De De Delegate Cardin, the, the, you introduced that by saying there has to be some discretion. I agree, there has to be discretion. The problem with this bill is that there's no discretion, it's mandatory. Number two, no one's requesting footage of police officers walking around doing nothing. 
the, the problem in this bill is that the, the list of permitted denials is not the same thing as the list of when the camera has to be on recording police uh, investigative and enforcement activity. I was trying to give some specific examples of things that would be excluded. So for example, um, the, 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 the property searches is, is one, but the, the reason that, that sort of um, trying to rewrite the list of um, exclusions from the mandatory denial is a losing enterprise is that these terms are not self-defining. So for example, the bill says um, we will uh, allow the release of uh, uh, arrests and detentions. But of course, what constitutes a detention and even sometimes what constitutes an arrest is literally the subject of debate day in and day out in uh, case after case after case uh, in the Maryland courts. And I'll give you a, a, a concrete example of that, um, a dramatic concrete example of that. So after the death of Detective Souter, as, as many of you well know, uh, the Baltimore police took the unprecedented and unconstitutional uh, decision to lock down the Harlem Park neighborhood and subject all of the people who lived there or who sought to travel through there or visit there to unconstitutional um, detentions and questioning. Now, we requested uh, after the, the, the lockdown, the body-worn camera footage of all of the officers enforcing that lockdown and we got it. And what it showed is that what the police were doing um, was not what the BPD claimed they were doing. Uh, and it showed um, unlawful detention after unlawful detention. We filed a lawsuit about that. And in that lawsuit, the BPD claimed because that's what they had to claim in order to not concede liability, that none of these things that were obviously detentions were actually detentions. They said they were all voluntary encounters. With this bill, there's no review of their characterization of the video. They can say, as they did actually say uh, in the Harlem Park case, that, that things that are detentions are not detentions, they're voluntary encounters, and therefore no video. And that's unreviewable because it's a mandatory denial. There's no way for, for me as the requester to contest that, and there's no judge who will ever review it. And so that's the problem with this whole idea of deny everything except. And the idea that, that discretionary denials are not an adequate way of dealing with this um, is simply wrong. I mean, look, first of all, discretionary denials are what applies to the entire corpus of police records right now, police investigatory records, many of which raise just as many and just as important privacy concerns as body-worn camera footage. And we don't say all police records have to be denied, except we have a system of discretionary denials, which explicitly includes privacy as something to be considered. That's explicit in the law. So the idea that they can't consider that now is simply untrue. And there has not been any problem either with body-worn camera footage or with the entire other corpus of police records with that system of discretionary denials. And, <clears throat> and as Delegate Moon said, the idea that the police are out there willy-nilly releasing things uh, is, is a fantasy. It's not true. In, in, in actuality, the problem is exactly the opposite. The General Assembly last year um, uh, change the law to finally allow access to police um, internal affairs records. And what you have is police departments simply flouting the law and claiming it's not in the public interest uh, and denying it as a blanket discretionary denial. The problem is not that we're releasing too much. It's that uh, the public does not have um, adequate access to police records. And the idea that the police cannot Look, the idea that the ACLU doesn't care about privacy is just ridiculous. We obviously do, I do, the national office does. And as I said, if, you, if this bill were limited to the specific provisions dealing with victims of sexual assault, et cetera, we would not be opposing this bill. 
but the provision, what, what Delegate Moon called the sweeper provision, which says deny everything except is dangerous, way overbroad, and the completely wrong way um, to approach uh, managing police records. Thank you very much. Further questions from panel? Thank you very much. That concludes the testimony for Senate Bill 31 and concludes the testimony for bills today. Uh, we will be back tomorrow with uh, more uh, Senate bill hearings. We may have a voting session tomorrow. Later in the afternoon, we'll be letting the committee know, letting people know on the floor. Certainly, we'll have a voting session on Thursday. So with that, thank you all very much. <laughs>